Hello, folks. So, another week, another announcement. And before we get into discussing the uh, two assigned chapters today, I want to start with a word of warning. So, turn to my PowerPoint for just a moment and talk about what we're going to be talking about. So, So I want to start off with a word of caution about the textbook. And then, but most of my comments will be related to chapter 13 about morality, marriage and human sexuality, and a couple observations about chapter 14 on bioethics. Now, that said, word of caution. Now, apparently Brandon is reconsidering whether or not to continue using this textbook and I've been requested by the course manager to give my feedback on it. And you know what? There are some very good things to be said for this text. I think it does a really good job in chapters one through seven of summarizing the major schools of thought when it comes to ethics. And chapter eight, I think does a pretty good job of suggesting one way of fusing, of creating a fusion of the best of these various schools of thought. Uh, but some of the later chapters make some rather large assumptions. And as a scholar, it's a bit nettlesome to me that sometimes I'm reading the text along with you all, and sometimes I go pages without seeing a single footnote. Remember, in academia, you can only you only have the right to opine if you can support your point and pages and pages of broad assumptions about human nature and culture um, without substantiation, that throws up a red flag right there. Now, as a result then, I will be pointing out some of these issues and to try to supplement uh, this, the, these omissions. Let me start with a general observation about the chapter on morality, marriage, and human sexuality. Now, although the authors in the early chapters made a pretty clear distinction between ethics and morals, I, in this chapter, they seem to use the two terms synonymously. And I think that's potentially really uh, confusing. You'll recall that the key distinction between morals and ethics is that morals is based on external authority, received authority. Typically, that's a matter of social norms or religious doctrine. While ethics is part of philosophy, and as such, it's based on reason, important distinction. For that reason, I find it a tad surprising to see so many references in this chapter to scripture. Moreover, not uh, it's not like um, from the context, it strikes me that the authors, when they use the word religion and scripture, they seem to just be assuming that that's obviously Christianity and the Bible. But you know, folks, I'm a scholar of world religions and I read this kind of presuppos presupposition. I am start thinking, wait, wait, there's, for, if you're going to work religion into it, there's far more <laughs> to religion, world religions, than just Christianity. Geez, what is the single fastest growing religion in the world? Is it Christianity? No, folks, that's Islam. So why aren't we referring to the Quran? What's the third largest religion in the world? Hinduism. But I don't see any reference to the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Vedas. Don't have a copy of the Vedas at hand. What about the fourth largest religion? Buddhism. Most common religion in the Far East. Oh, and if we're going to talk about the Far East, what about Taoism? No, no, no. Oh, even if we're going to stick with the Abrahamic traditions. What about the mother of all the Abrahamic traditions? Judaism. Not seeing any reference to that here either. 
fifth, I almost forgot to mention the fifth largest religion in the world, Sikhism. Lots and lots about the Bible. I'm not seeing anything about the Guru Granth Sahib. And even if we are going to stick with Christianity, there are so many different types of Christianity, so many different groups that consider themselves Christian, which other groups may not. What about our good friends, the Mormons? Or if we're talking about ancient Christianity, one of the biggest influences on Christianity was the Gnostic movement. No. no. Everything, every reference is to this one book. Moreover, folks, why the heck are we referring to scripture at all? This is a class on ethics. It is not a class of morals. And there are so many different, if you're going to work religion on, in on it, why stick with just Christianity? But even then, it's ethics. Ethics is based on reason. Maybe a little bit of intuition and observation as well. It is not about received religious revelation. That would be a class in world religions or a class in morals or values clarification. Let's turn at this point then to the key observations that I think we must question and challenge in the assigned reading. So turning again to my PowerPoint for a moment. And we find that in the text it states when on page 271, when a love involving meaningful sex occurs, it is deeper than any other kind of love. But folks, this presupposes a very Western and a very modern outlook. What we find when we look at world philosophy and history is that people like Aristotle, Epicurus, and Pythagoras, did not consider marital love to be the highest form of love. For them, friendship was the highest form of love because it was the most selfless. When you're married, you are presumably bound with the other person through lifestyle and sexuality and offspring. But friends, according to the ancients, this was a pure and more important kind of love than mere marriage. So, gosh, folks, if you're going to make a broad assumption about the nature of love, you, and you just totally ignore Epicurus, Pythagoras, and Aristotle, you're making a broad over-assumption here. In fact, what we find in the ancient world is the, the greatest love story in the Greco-Roman world did not involve women at all. It's the story of Damon and Pythias. Now, for those of you who are taking the time to watch this video, I guess I'll give you the advantage of a thumbnail version of the story. Damon and Pythias were supposedly were followers of the teachings of Pythagoras. They were dear friends. Well, according to the legend, uh, Damon fell afoul of a local tyrant, and the tyrant uh, used his absolute power to condemn Damon to capital punishment. Now, well, Damon pleases with the tyrant, please let me go back to my family one last time and take care, uh, straighten my affairs. And the Chiron says, oh, no, if I let you do that, you're just going to run away. His good friend Pythias says, comes up and says, I will stand in my friend's stead. I will go to prison for my friend. And the tyrant says, hmm, this is interesting. He says, um, 
And what if your friend doesn't come back? Will you be executed for your friend, Pythias? Dude, says Pythias. Well, I'm paraphrasing a bit. Dude, I'm down with that. Well, time passes and it's getting closer and closer and closer to the time of execution. And the tyrant keeps on coming by. Yo, Pythias, you're gonna deny your friendship? Come on, dude, don't you want to live? Well, Pythias loves his friend, Damon, and he knows that his friend, Damon, would not let him down. And lo and behold, comes the day of the execution, and Pythias is being led to the place of execution in the stead of his friend, Damon. And suddenly, who comes riding along? It's Damon, on his way back from his home. He was beset by pirates, and he had to do everything that he could to get back in time, but even knowing that death was uh, waiting for him, he appears at the place of execution to ensure that his friend Pythias will not be killed in his stead. In the ancient world, this was considered the epi epitome, the acme of true love. Now, the love of a husband for wife, not a mother for a child, one man for his dear friend. Let's turn to page 272. Once again, our authors use the expression, a domino argument, but folks, this is, I don't know why they keep on doing this. This is called a slippery slope argument, and it is usually considered an informal logical fallacy. Page uh, 272, goes on to set forth an argument against sexual liberation on the basis of its offensiveness to public taste. I see a couple big problems with that argument, which our authors do not bring up. First, that argument is essentially based on what's called social or sometimes cultural relativism. Um, and that's problematical in terms of ethics. Social relativism or cultural relativism holds that there are no universal truths at all. All we can say is what is considered to be right or good in a given society or a given culture. Um, but there's another issue I see that they do not address. I think they're making a tacit assumption that there's a general consensus about these kind of behaviors when it comes to sexual liberation. But folks, if you travel, just even if you just travel in the country, and particularly if you travel in the world, you will observe that behaviors that are considered offensive in one area are often considered entirely appropriate in another. Anyone ever traveled to Castro, the Castro district in San Francisco? I must admit, the first time I did, I was quite shocked. Um, you know? There are behaviors that are entirely acceptable in the Castro district that aren't acceptable in, oh, I don't know, um, downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for example. Um, on page 279, the authors state that the Bible decrees that monogamy is the most accepted form of marriage. And again, I find, as a scholar of religion, I find this rather shocking because when I read the text, the default in the Old Testament is actually polygamy. What is it? Solomon had something like a thousand wives and concubines combined. And that was considered to be a testament to his power. When we turn to the New Testament, we find that the Apostle Paul was not a big fan of sexuality at all. He's quoted, I think this meme is a little off, He's quoted as saying that it's better to marry than to burn, um, which is to say that he thought that it was better by and large to be celibate than to be married. But oh my gosh, if people have to be in marital relations, I guess they can kind of, it's acceptable that they get married. Paul was not a big fan of marriage in and of itself. Page uh, 281 states that the Bible is 
opposed to homosexuality. And you know, I must admit that is a common understanding, but let me refer you to this text here. What the Bible really says about homosexuality by Daniel Hominiak. Uh, now, Hominiak's contention is that the six or seven so-called clobber verses, which are cited to condemn homosexuality, um, they're cited in translations of the Bible. It's in my copy of the Bible. It has the Greek along with the English translation. Folks, when a work is translated, it is necessarily interpreted. And if you're reading the Bible in English, we are not really, uh, you are reading typically a translation an English translation of a Greek trend of a Latin translation of a Greek translation of a Hebrew translation. Um, if we drill down into what the actual words mean within the context of that particular time and that particular society, suddenly a lot of these passages, it turns out, mean something very different than the way they are commonly interpreted, or at least so argues. Daniel Hominiak. On the same page, uh, our authors mention that uh, the argument that homosexuality is unnatural. Well, I'm going to share with you something else in just a moment. But let me point out that there is another argument. Now, I admit this is rather controversial, but Turning to, ah, here we go. I mean, I linked this web page on the print form of the announcement. This is just one article that I've encountered that deals with this topic. But if we're going to state that homosexuality is unnatural, how do we explain the fact that a lot of animals in a state of nature are known to engage in homosexuality. In fact, our closest relatives are the bonobos, the pygmy chimpanzees. And oh, they are sometimes called the make love, not war monkeys. It's a, only slightly tongue in cheek because folks, um, whenever there's a kind of conflict or tension within a troop of bonobos, uh, they engage in sexual activity and they aren't really very discriminating as to the gender of the other ape in question. Uh, point is, if we're going to say that it's unnatural, um, surely our authors should be pointing out that biologists have long found that this kind of behavior occurs in nature. Let's turn. Then, so those are some, I think, important arguments that our authors conveniently skip over. And yes, I know they're controversial, but people do make these arguments and you can't really engage with this topic if you don't acknowledge and engage with those arguments. If you, you don't have to agree, you don't have to disagree, but you have to acknowledge them. And if you're going to disagree, you need to come up with a reason. Reason, not prejudice, not external authority, reason why you disagree. That's when you're doing ethics or more generally philosophy. So chapter 14 is devoted to the bioethics and the ethical issues in medicine. And I only have a couple comments that are worth uh, addressing and as it happens, pop culture alert. So let me go back to the share function for just a moment. Ah, here we go. So, if you're fond of medical dramas, I have to point out that the different models of how medical professionals should engage with patients 
and their family and their families. Paternalism, radical individualism, and the middle ground of the reciprocal view often come up in medical dramas. I have to think that that's a large part of the reason why medical dramas are so popular. So, for example, Grey's Anatomy, but also House MND, I love that show. House, I think, leaned more towards the paternalistic viewpoint, or if you want a more British alternative, one of my favorite medical shows that's on the air currently, Doc Martin, and again, a, um, um, a tormented genius at diagnostics. Um, who means more towards the paternalistic viewpoint. On page 306 and 307, our authors address ethics and behavior control and ethical issues and problems with behavior control. And oh my gosh, folks, how can you deal with that topic without bringing to mind a classic Stanley Kubrick movie, A Clockwork Orange, which I've talked about before. Well, uh, as you recall in that story, someone who is a very violent criminal is forced to undergo a experimental technique or they are forced to watch violent material and every time they start to get a thrill from it, they're shocked. Well, it's a science fiction movie, it's, but it's playing with that notion, how far can the state legitimately go in terms of experiments or treatments to curb the excesses of the violently antisocial? So, as I mentioned, I've been trying to keep these announcements to no more than two pages, and I suspect I might have gone over 15 minutes this time, I'm afraid, because I added a couple things off the cuff. So, but trying to keep around 15 minutes or so. So, there are my thoughts. I think our authors uh, in this section make a broad, lot of broad assumptions. I think the, and they feel, I think, to bring up important arguments or counter arguments that are being booted on these kind of topics. And that's why I share them with you. So there's my thoughts, agree, disagree, it's up to you. But if you agree or disagree, for you to be doing ethics, for you to be doing philosophy, you need to be able to cite a piece to support your points. 